All right, so we are talking about shame, guilt, and fear, and the plan is that we would uh, do a shorter version of what we've been doing uh, this, uh, this series, and we'd cover this for about 25 uh, minutes and then leave the remainder of the time for Q&A. And uh, I did get asked this question beforehand. The Q&A is about anything for the whole course, okay? So it could be about any of the motions we talked about. It does not have to be about shame and guilt and fear. In fact, uh, I, I would ask that as I'm talking that you would be thinking about questions because uh, if, if we don't, then I will feel shame and embarrassment and I will, not, uh, I will not be able to sleep at night with all the guilt of just staring at us for 30 straight minutes, <laughs> blinking at one another. So let's, uh, let's do that. Turn in your Bible to, uh, we'll look uh, at Genesis, Genesis chapter two. And while you're turning there, uh, I want to give a, uh, just a brief summary of what is shame, guilt, and regret. Shame, guilt, and regret. So we'll, we'll take each one of those. So guilt. Okay, so this is, um, I think we all know what it means to feel guilty. We feel under condemnation is probably another way to say it, a biblical way. We feel under condemnation. But I, I want to specify that guilt uh, is not merely a feeling, okay? So uh, guilt also is objective. Uh, we are truly guilty before God, no matter how we feel about that objective reality. So uh, there are all kinds of people who should feel guilt when they don't, but that does not mean they're not guilty. So our feelings don't determine when someone is guilty or innocent. Uh, that is objective according to God's standard. Uh, but that feeling of guilt is the feeling of coming under condemnation. So um, there is, uh, there's several verses that we could look at. Let me just point out one here. So this is uh, James 2.10. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. So even if we fail in one point, we are failing to love and therefore guilty of the law of love, guilty of uh, falling short. So shame, then if that's guilt, what is shame? So shame, I'm describing it as the feeling of embarrassment. So it's, it's an embarrassing uh, feeling, an embarrassing emotion, or the, it's when you realize a failure that you've fallen short of a standard. So um, this is uh, Luke 16, 3. And this is Jesus talking. Uh, and he says, And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. Meaning, uh, he does not want to be a beggar because that falls short of a standard, a cultural standard in this case, and in his mind as well. And what we would all say is uh, a, an understandable feeling. He's saying, I, I don't, I, I don't want to feel that embarrassment of what it means to, to beg. So shame comes when you realize you've fallen short of some sort of standard. So then regret, what is regret? Regret is when you wish you could do something differently or you wish you could go back in time and change it. And you, you feel, it, it, it's like having a bruise that you, like, even though you, you got hit by the object, the bruise is still there and it's like, ah, oh, I regret that. I wish I could do something different. So those are ways to describe shame, guilt, and regret. So where does shame come from? And that leads us to Genesis 2. So look at Genesis 2, starting in verse 24. It says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay, so before the fall, they were not ashamed. Okay, so there was no shame taking place uh, prior to Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then look at chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 
And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Okay, and then this is the verse that's contrasted with the previous one in chapter two. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. And then the implication is shame. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So they're, they're trying to hide their shame. They're trying to cover it up. So this, this is what happens when we are ashamed. We, we cower. We want to go away from the light. We want to cover up. Verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? Because he's hiding, right? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Okay, so shame is also accompanied by fear, fear of the Lord that's not righteous, but fear of him, like I want to get away from God. I, I, I want to flee from him. And the man said, um, oh no, sorry, verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman you gave to be with me. Okay, so he should have been ashamed of that statement. Okay, so this actually is instructive. We're now seeing, uh, man, this is terrible. We're seeing He's ashamed of certain things, but then he's not ashamed of other things that he should be ashamed of. So our, we're, we're messed up, guys. <laughs> like we are just messed up because we are just like Adam. There's certain things that we are ashamed of that are right and good. We should be ashamed of them. But then there's other things that we're not ashamed of that are really bad. And he goes on to say, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Okay, and what is he doing? He's blaming something else. He's blaming someone else. And this continues. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So she passes the blame as well. When we feel shame and guilt, um, it is just very difficult to take responsibility. It's been happening in the garden. Uh, we, we don't want to take responsibility uh, for our actions and we want to pass the blame. Okay, so why then um, do we feel shame? All right, let me give you some reasons why someone might feel shame. The first is shame from our own sin according to God's standards. So th this is what Adam and Eve did. They're feeling shame according to falling. God's standard is one thing. They fell short. It's their sin is the source of their shame. It's not just with Adam and Eve. There's all kinds of passages. Here's one. Ezra 9, 6 through 7. Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush. So that's the embarrassment, right? Blushing. I, I'm embarrassed to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt is mounted to the heavens. All right, so uh, he's feeling guilty and he's feeling embarrassed and uh, shame. Uh, then there's a, a fascinating text in 1 John 2 um, if you're in Sunday school, you studied this recently, and it says, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame at his coming. So shame's a big deal. It's all the way up to the return of Christ. Um, God wants us to not be ashamed of what we have done and what we have believed, but rather he wants us to have confidence at his return. Okay, so that's sin can cause shame. All right, let me give you another one. We can feel shame from our perceived failure or perceived sin 
and are a standard that we have set that's not God's law. Okay, just a little more complicated. So there's real shame that we should feel and do feel when we sin. But then there's a standard that we set up that's not God's standard. And we can perceive something as sin or perceive it as falling short when actually that's our standard and um, not, not God's. Let me give you some examples, okay? Um, so maybe, maybe you've uh, been hospitable and you've hosted people in your home and uh, you forget to clean a room in your house. This has never happened to the Perones, by the way, <laughs> just to let you know. <laughs> just kidding. One of our whole rooms for several years of our lives was completely storage uh, for a while. And that person goes in and they, they're going to the bathroom and then they open the door and they see all of your mess and you are ashamed. You're ashamed. What? You've not sinned. There's no sin there, but you've fallen short of a standard that you have. And now this can actually get into, this can bleed into uh, sinful problems where there's some people that never want to host anyone in their home because they have a standard of what their home should look like and they'll never reach it. So they just don't host anyone. Uh, and that's an that's a imposed standard upon hospitality that, ne- that does not need to be there, and we don't need to feel ashamed if our house is not spick and span when someone comes over. In fact, it's actually refreshing to host people when your house is not the best. So that's one example. Um, let me give you another one. So uh, maybe you're in school, and you're not the sharpest crown in the box, okay? And you get your test score back, and you're pretty, you're pretty excited about it. It wasn't awesome in your mind, but you're excited. And then you realize amongst the hubbub of all your other students that they got a way better test score than you. And yours was like really low, if not the lowest. And all of a sudden you feel shame. You didn't sin unless you were lazy. Uh, you didn't sin unless you cheated. Uh, but you feel shame because there's now the standard that you've, you've fallen short of. Um, there's, I'll, I'll tell you one funny story of personal shame. I, I will confess to this one. Um, when we first got to <laughs> First Baptist, uh, I got invited to speak at uh, a, uh, a banquet for one of the Sunday school classes here. And it was a Valentine's banquet, which actually is appropriate today. And it was uh, a dress-up formal kind of banquet. And I did not realize that when they said, hey, you should look a little bit nicer. I, did, I had my own standard of what that thought in my mind. And I was newer. And so I showed up wearing jeans and a button down. And I think like a blazer like this. And I show up and I, I thought I looked cool. <laughs> I did. I thought I looked cool. And I showed up and I realized that I was very underdressed. I did not fit the appropriate attire memo. And I was feeling ashamed. And do you know what? This is actually a great story. The Sunday school teacher uh, came up and they warmly welcomed me. And I said, hey, am I, am I like not wearing what I should? Like, oh, no, 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 it's totally fine. You look great. This is fantastic. Well, then like five minutes later, they come around the corner, her and her husband, and they went to their car and they changed into jeans. So nice, so nice to make me feel better and so that I wasn't the only one in jeans. So nice. And then I obviously realized I definitely, <laughs> I definitely blew it. Um, but it was great. So anyway, there's all kinds of standards you can fall short of and uh, perceive that are not necessarily sin. Let me give you another category. This is shame that we could, ex- that we could feel that comes from, it, says, it comes from our hearts, but it's, it's, pressed upon us by others when we have not sinned, okay? This one, this one is unfortunate. So this is Job, Job 19, 13. These 10 times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? So Job is talking to his friends and they're just putting this pressure on him and he's feeling it. He's feeling the weight of this. Um, This can be where you may not have done anything wrong, but someone comes up or maybe it's a spouse or maybe it's a family member 
and they just berate you and shame you and they say all kinds of harsh things towards you and you feel like the scum of the earth after talking with them. Even though what you objectively did was not necessarily falling short of God's standard, they are casting shame upon you. So that's, that's one way. Um, at the same time, we can experience shame from others for actually having fallen short of God's standard. Okay, so this is when uh, maybe we didn't do something we should have, and we actually really did blow it, and people are letting us know that we blew it, and we feel shame. And uh, that, that's an experience as well, uh, and it's more complicated. Um, let me give you a couple of verses to go with that. Here is 2 Thessalonians 3.14. Now, th- this is one of those verses that people don't tweet out and you don't see on commercials in the Super Bowl. <laughs> okay, if anyone does not obey what we said in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them that he may be ashamed. Okay, that's the Apostle Paul, okay? So I didn't say it, that came from Paul. And what he is saying is, there's actually a healthy shame that you should attempt to produce in other people. You have to do it lovingly and caringly, and there's a whole lot to say about that. But my point here is that uh, Paul is not afraid to say, hey, it's okay if you make someone feel ashamed when they have sinned in such a way that is biblically appropriate to, to bring that about. There's a whole lot more to say there, but I'm, I'm just pointing out that uh, that is a biblical category. Here's another one. The rod and reproof give wisdom but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother, okay? So uh, this is a mother um, that has not disciplined, not spanked, not correct their child, and uh, they left. What, what they've done is they've left the child to themselves, to rule themselves and to be their own standard and their own God. And when that child grows and is out in public, it's a shame to the mother, and uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, but it's a real thing, and uh, it, it's it's shame that's happening to someone because they have not been disciplining their child. Okay, so those are a lot of nuances there. Um, there's more to say, but uh, let's let's keep going for sake of time here. Is all shame bad? Is all shame bad? Okay, let me give you a few verses. So Psalm 610. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment, okay? Uh, This is is the psalmist, the the psalm asking God to shame his enemies, okay? So I take it that that means not all shame is bad, that that this is a a shame they should feel and they're not, and he's asking that they they would do this. Here's another one, Ephesians 5, 11 through 14. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Okay, so uh, our culture, oh boy, our culture is just obsessed with sexual sin. And uh, there is no shame when there should be shame. Uh, because Paul objectively says it is, it is objectively shameful to speak about the things they do in secret. Um, and Paul's point here is that they, what they're doing is shameful, and it's our job to expose that to the light. It's our job to expose that darkness and say, hey, that's not good. That's not good. And when we do that, then what happens is uh, uh, either people respond under conviction of the Holy Spirit and they awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and Christ shines on them, or they run and hide and run away from God, like with Adam and Eve, or they get ticked off and rebel and hate you for doing that. So th- those are some of the three options there. Here's Paul again, 1 Corinthians 6, 5. He says, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you and wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? I believe he's talking about lawsuits here. And he's saying, you shouldn't sue one another, Christians. I say this to your shame, okay? 
He actually does this again in 1 Corinthians 15. Wake up from your drunken stupor as it is right and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. They, they were not feeling the shame when, when they needed to. Uh, this is Jeremiah 16, uh, 6, 15. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Ugh, that phrase could be said of our culture, 2024. Uh, they did not know how to blush. Uh, Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. And then he re- that verse is so important, he repeats it again in chapter 8. It's the same verse. Okay, um, it is also, so okay, so when we sin, uh, there's a shame that accompanies that that is appropriate, but we are so twisted in our hearts that sometimes we are actually ashamed of righteousness. So instead of being ashamed of unrighteousness, we actually become ashamed of righteousness. Okay, so that's backward. It's backward. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. And he says, whoever, Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, and that phrase is very important. It's not just Jesus, it's Jesus and his words uh, and, and what, he, what he's teaching. And he repeats this again. This is in the Luke's account as well. Um, Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. He's saying, don't be ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. All right, so did Jesus experience shame? All right, we've asked that with every emotion thus far. Um, And the answer uh, is found in Luke uh, 18, 31 through 34. It says this, and taking the 12, he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. All right. So remember I said earlier that people can put pressure on us and shamefully treat us. This is what happened to Jesus. Jesus Christ was shamefully treated. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. This is amazing. This is really, really amazing. Okay, so think about this. In the garden, before the fall, Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. They sin. They go to fig leaves. They hide from God and go to fig leaves. It doesn't work. It's not enough. And God kills an animal and gives them skins to clothe themselves. But even that is not enough. And so then Jesus Christ comes thousands of years later, to live a perfect life, and he never did anything, never did anything that was shameful. Can you imagine? He never did anything that was shameful. And he was shamefully treated. And then he was hung naked on a cross to be shamed before the whole city, the whole world. And he was shamed, and on that cross, he died, his blood flowed, and now he clothes us in his righteousness, and it's his nakedness that then covers our nakedness. It's he he endured the cross despising the shame. He did it despite the shame. He did it so that you and I never have to be ashamed before God. So you and I don't have to shrink back at the coming of Jesus because now, as Hebrews 10 says in Hebrews 12, we can boldly come through the new curtain, which is his body, through the body of Christ, we can boldly approach the throne of grace 
and we don't have to hide like Adam and Eve, but we can now come to God and experience freedom, security, and no shame. We can be unashamed and boldly come before him and then before others as well. That's amazing. That's good news. And that leads us to what should we do when we feel shame? All right, I'm going to fire off a few things here. So first, we must calibrate our shame according to God's standard, okay? You will feel shame in your life. And what I want to encourage you to do is that you calibrate that, you, you align that, you adjust that to meet God's standards so that you are appropriately ashamed of the things that are sinful and not ashamed of righteousness. And then when someone imposes a standard upon you that's not biblical, you're not ashamed. You don't, you don't have to be ashamed. So maybe, maybe you're a parent and maybe you're feeling a lot of pressure because other parents are imposing their school choices upon your child and upon your family. And if you're not sinning, you don't have to be ashamed about it. You don't have to be ashamed at all. And don't let, let your shame match God's standard, not some other standard that we invent. Okay, so calibrate um, uh, our shame according to God's standard. Let me give you another one. When we are feeling shame, I think it's appropriate to ask God in prayer to act according to his standards. Okay? This is what, this is what um, David does in that psalm I read earlier. He, acts, he asks God to shame his enemies and to vindicate him. So when they are shaming him, he goes to God in prayer and asks God to vindicate him and to shame his enemies. So he, he uses prayer as a way to cast his burdens uh, upon the Lord. Uh, in your notes there, you see Psalm 25. That's another example where David does that. Okay, let me give you another one. Believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. This is what I was uh, getting at there earlier. Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to what? Shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. When you sin, when I sin, and we all sin, run to the cross, believe the gospel, and hope in that, and let Christ's love fill your heart so that you know that, yes, you fell short, but Jesus Christ took your shame and you can be freed and forgiven, run to the gospel. Don't, uh, don't run from God, run to God. Okay, there's more to say about that, but I promise Q&A, if I don't do Q&A, I think we might have a mutiny. So I want to make sure we do that. So uh, what questions do you have? Uh, it could be about shame, it could be about, let's see, we covered anger and frustration, we covered anxiety, we covered fear, uh, we covered passions, uh, we covered sorrow and grief and loss. We've covered a lot of emotions, thoughts, questions, things you would like to pursue. A, a couple things. Do make sure it is a question or we will shame you. Uh, no, no, no. Do, make, do make sure it's a question. We'll be nice, but do make sure it's a question and uh, do attach the question to something we've talked about as it relates to emotions. That'd be good. Oh, good question. Is there a difference between feeling guilty and being under conviction? Okay. So, someone can feel guilty because they came under, they fell short of a standard. But I would want to say that's a little different than automatically knowing that the Holy Spirit is convicting them. So, uh, if I fall short um, of a standard that I've imposed and I feel bad about it, I should not assume that's the Holy Spirit. Rather, what I should do is when I read the word and I feel guilty because I've fallen short of this standard, I should always assume that's the Holy Spirit 
convicting me. Uh, so the Holy Spirit, so guilt, guilt is a wonderful gift from God after the fall because it, it sounds an alarm in our hearts and our minds to know that we have fallen short of a standard. And that guilt, uh, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and convicting us and saying, you have fallen short, come to Christ and receive forgiveness, we absolutely should respond to that. So uh, I hope that is helpful. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, so to repeat the question for the uh, audio and video, um, if you uh, have little kids, you're parenting, and they have big emotions, how do you provide instruction and disciple them to understand those emotions and not validate every emotion, but provide them guidance? Is that fair? Okay, lot to say here. So, um, this is a whole class. Um, <laughs> okay, so emotions in a child are indicators of what that child is treasuring and valuing and wanting. So those emotions are always pointing to something that's internally going on in that child's heart. And so it's really important that we disciple our kids to be able to know that uh, when they're angry, let's take anger, when they're angry about a toy, that anger is because they're being selfish. Um, they are not sharing. They're, they're idolizing. It, it's revealing an idol of their heart. When they're scared, they're not just scared for no reason. They're scared for some reason. So that emotion points to what's taking place in their heart. So I would do a few things. So these are general, and maybe if you, there's more specific things I can give more specific. Um, there's uh, several books that you can read with kids. There are Christian books that are wonderful that talk about emotions. Um, I'm thinking off the cuff here, but uh, uh, there's a, for little, for little littles, uh, we started out our little kids on, uh, it's a baby believer book called Holy Week. Uh, it's called an emotions primer. And it just walks through different emotions with biblical, with verses. And so it has like, uh, fun ones like surprise at the tomb, and then it has uh, some that are sad when uh, they're at the tomb before the surprise. Um, it has anger with Jesus in the temple. Okay, so that's that's an opportunity to instruct them on what biblical anger is and is not. And so I would recommend as soon as you can take them through uh, a book like that that shows them what emotions are, so that when they have that emotion you can have language to be able to describe that. Moving beyond that, um, there's a lot of resources. Uh, the book series called Good News for Little Hearts, uh, CCF produced it. Uh, they go through various emotions. Uh, many, I've recommended them before. So Jack's Tales Twitches is about anger. Uh, Caspian Crashes the Party is about jealousy. Um, Henry the Hedgehog, there's one on him and sadness and his pet. Uh, so those are all really good, and that, would, that takes it to the next level. So I'd, I'd recommend that series, Good News for Little Hearts. That's really good. Um, but more than all of that, here's what I would say. Um, our kids learn about emotions from us. <laughs> so you can read all the books in the whole world, but the best book is going to be you teaching them Self-control, self-control. So um, it, it, it is not a virtue to let them uh, run with their emotions wild. Uh, God has designed it um, so that we would exhibit the fruit of the spirit, which is self-control. And then we would uh, expect the same from our kids. So I'll just be honest, I, we're getting into dangerous territory here. Uh, so I'll be honest. Uh, there's been times when um, one of our kids has been just really upset about something. Uh, it could be something small. And they're just like uncontrollable. And I'm like, hey, buddy, 
we, you know, this is not a big deal. That toy broke. You know what? People are more important than things. And I do the whole idol of the heart thing, you know, and like, this is, this is not that big of a deal. I'm so sorry it happened. This is really terrible it happened. I'm very sorry. It's not a big deal. But they're like, they're like, the roller coaster is like left the port and it's like flying. And they're like, it's just like a nightmare. And I'm like, hey, buddy. And I try a couple of times and I'm like, hey, buddy, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to spank you. And all of a sudden they can control their emotions. It's amazing. And look, that is not bad. That's actually really good. It's really good. Because they're able to, I'm like, wow, that was miraculous. All of a sudden you had control. It's amazing. And they control it when they want to, when they want to. Um, and, uh, and I know this because other folks uh, who remain, name, remain nameless, when, uh, when things have gone bad and they've got an emotional state, as soon as they bring out something that they love and that's shiny, that feeds their idol, then all of a sudden, all the tears are dried up and everything's fine and wonderful. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a virtue to instruct our kids to be able to control their emotions um, and know how to um, know what is expected from God's law and what's not. More questions? Yes. Uh, oh, good question. I'm so glad you asked that. Would I react that same way when the emotion is fear? Uh, not likely. Okay, let me give you some reasons why. So in the Bible, fear is, at the end of the day, a disbelief in God's power and in God's love. But how, how God often corrects fear is with his presence and by drawing near. So do not be afraid, for I am with you. Um. Over and over again, the scriptures say that. So there's a command, and then God's presence comes. So uh, when one of our kids has been fearful, and they're very scared, um, the, the way to get that, the, the way to, to address that is with a loving fatherly or loving motherly presence that says, hey, buddy, I'm right here. I'm right here. And I love you. You know that? Do you know the daddy doesn't want anything bad to happen to you? But you know who loves daddy, who loves you even more than daddy? Your good shepherd. And so then we quote Psalm 23. We talk about Psalm 23. Um, now, I will say um, there are times when uh, the fear is so irrational and just so persistent that um, uh, just your presence is not enough. You have to come up with other ways to instruct. And uh, I'll give you a, maybe a few examples. Um, probably one just for sake of time. So um, if, um, oh, let's take an easy one. Let's take roller coasters. Okay, so this is a more mild one. Uh, we went to a theme park and our son uh, really wanted to ride a roller coaster. And we're like, okay, let's do it. And so we got up there, and all of a sudden, he don't want to ride that roller coaster anymore. All right, so there's a lot of things you can do here to help them out. Uh, there's a lot of different things. You can offer a reward. Hey, buddy, if you do that, we're going to take you out to ice cream. One option. Uh, you can take the, no, you're a man. That's not scary. Get on there. I don't recommend that one. <laughs> don't recommend that one. Um, uh, or uh, you can take the, 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 um, the long path of a double pass. So, hey, let's watch people on that roller coaster. Here they go. Look, they all lived. They're all walking off now. Isn't that amazing? Look at that kid. He's so happy. You've never been that happy in your life. Isn't that wonderful? Wow, okay, that kid is happy. Mommy's going to ride it. Mommy's going to ride it. She's going to go. Um, and then, then the kid gets in line. And he's, he's ready. He's doing it. And you get up to the front, and it's the moment. And he says, I don't want to go. That's the time you say, let's go. We're, we're, we're getting on. So my, I was, my, my presence was here, but it's not enough. I'm going to force you on this thing, and you're going to have a blast. And it totally worked, and he had a blast. And if your kid, if it didn't work and he hated it, it's going to be okay. Uh, they can come see me for therapy for a long time after that. <laughs> 
<laughs> but my point is, uh, I do approach fear a little differently, but at some, at some point you gotta say, hey buddy, we're just not gonna be scared. You're gonna jump off the ledge. You're gonna take the dive. Um, you're gonna do that. To say it a different way, um, our children's fears do not dictate our lives. Uh, uh, we're the parents. They not, our, our kids do not direct us. We direct the parents. Uh, we direct the children, yeah. which is uh, the biblical model. Okay. Any other questions? We still got time. We got 15 minutes. A lot can happen in 15 minutes. Brandon. Yeah. <clears throat> so the question is, are our bodies, um, uh, what would you say, are our bodies connected to our emotions and control our emotions like some sort of chemical imbalance or something like that? Okay. A lot to say here. So uh, the Bible, um, the theological term is that our, our bodies are a psychoschematic union. It's a fancy word for saying that our souls impact our bodies, and our bodies impact our souls, okay? So um, let's take the first one. Our soul impacts our body. Uh, all over the Psalms, you, you, you hear him, you hear David crying out in anguish, and he says, my bones hurt, okay? Anxiety. If you're fearful about something, if you, if you keep going, you can get worked up into a, pan, a full-blown panic attack and your body's sweating and you're, you're anxious. So that's the soul impacting the body. Um, but the converse is also true. Our bodies impact our soul. So we all know this. Oh my goodness. We're talking about kids. Uh, sometimes the best thing you can say is, you need a nap. You are tired. Why, why are they so cranky? Well, they've missed every nap and we've been dragging them around and went to bed late last night and well, their body has a weakness that is impacting their little lives. And if I just immediately <laughs> come down on the anger or whatever it is, then I'm, I'm missing an important factor there that is, hey, they need some sleep. Um, if, if you don't get sleep for a certain amount of time, you're gonna think insane thoughts. Like your body starts to shut down and just totally rebel. And it's like, what are you doing? Um, there's all kinds of weaknesses that our body has that, that impact our soul. So, um, oh, there's so many. There's so many issues uh, that, our, that our body is broken and fallen that, that uh, we need to tend to. I do want to be clear, though. Um, I, I want to make a distinction between a weakness and a sin, okay? So, um, there is no temptation that is not common to man where God will not provide a way out, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So, I want to say our bodies cannot make us sin. Our bodies cannot make us sin. They can be a weakness that draw us in. They can even cause us to have emotions that are very troubling. But at the end of the day, our bodies cannot make us sin. So let me give you an example. Um, if a husband is in a rage with his wife and throws a plate against the wall because he's ticked. Uh, I've talked to many husbands that have done things like that. And they cannot say, I had a chemical imbalance, and therefore I did that. Now, they might have a chemical imbalance. Their body might be weak, but their body did not make them pick the plate up and throw it at their wife. That's a sin we're responsible for. Um, so I'm not discounting the role of the body, but what I'm saying is at the end of the day, uh, uh, our, our, our bodies are an influence and can even provide temptations, but uh, they cannot make our hearts sin. There's a lot to be said about that, but that's a short version. That was a good question. Good question. Um, and I'll, I'll say like, so um, let's take another issue. Um, just because you have an emotion, okay, let me say it this way. Uh, emotions in and of themselves are not automatically sinful. I actually hope that's one of the themes you've picked up on. Uh, an emotion can be holy or unholy. Uh, it's what that emotion points to that's taking place in their heart that can reveal a possible sin. So um, 
every emotion we've covered is not automatically sinful, uh, but it can be, and it'll, that's why it's so important to know what, where the role of the heart is in that. So like if, if you, uh, I'm, I'm belaboring here, you're not asking questions, but if you have a thyroid issue, okay? So a thyroid's a real issue. Um, a, a thyroid can make you feel all whacked out. I mean, it's a real medical thing. Like you can feel super sad, anxious, intense. Uh, that's, a, that's a physical weakness. And I would not want to say that's automatically sinful. But that thyroid weakness cannot excuse us to have sin of anxiety and despair. Um, it can be a factor that we must be aware of and address, uh, but that does not give us a reason to then spiral into a state of uh, sinful sadness. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I, that's a great question. And it's not just exclusive to teens. It's adults as well. Um, so I don't have teens, so I might not be super helpful with the teens, but I can talk about adults. Um, so it's a good question. So um, maybe you're in a relationship or maybe you know someone or maybe you're your friend and they are just, uh, we're talking about an emotional roller coaster. They're all over the map. Uh, I, um, a language that you could describe would be driven and tossed. Uh, one minute they're this way, the next minute they're that way. And when you're around, I don't know if you've been around that uh, in any extended period of time, when you're around that kind of environment, you can feel crazy if you're not, uh, don't have some like moral clarity and just like take, have a moment of uh, perception because one minute it's this way and one minute it's that way. And it's not just even with the extremes, it's also with anyone, um, every one of us have emotions that then when we encounter other people, those emotions can have an impact upon them. So uh, it's just like, it, it, it's like um, playing marbles. Like you flick the marble and it rolls over and hits another marble. So like it's, there's all kinds of emotions. What I want to say is a few things. Number one, the only person that is responsible for and can control your emotions is you. So uh, you cannot, we covered this with the anger one, you cannot cause me to be sin, sinfully angry or sinfully anxious. You cannot do that. Um, so what's important is to be able to say, okay, I need to take a, a God's wisdom perspective and be able to identify when this person, I need to have discernment is another biblical term, discernment to know this person, they are responding in a way that their emotions are indicating things that are falling short of God's standard or not accordance with righteousness. So they're too sad about that. They're too upset about that. They're too anxious about that. That is overblown. And I need to be able to see that and analyze it so that I then don't respond in the same way. We've all done this. You can get worked up in a frenzy with folks. It's just like a feeding frenzy where someone's just really ticked off and they get someone else really ticked off and it just the anger just keeps going and going and going or someone's really distraught over this relationship and it just it's the cycle that just all of a sudden it, it's like a tornado that goes through the whole tribe <laughs> um, and you got to be able to, to have clarity to say okay that person is not responding in the way that's appropriate and so I'm I'm going to then respond in a way that is self-controlled that is appropriate, that's honoring to God. And then what I speak to them and what I say to them is an opportunity to help them think more clearly and more biblically than they're currently doing. So I can speak a word of encouragement and say, hey, I know you're sad about that. I understand that. Let me tell you what has helped me in my sadness. Or I know you're really upset about that. And I get it. Uh, but let me tell you something. I think if we just take a minute and we think about um, how that person has been kind to us. I think that will help honor God to reduce our anger and think about things we're thankful for them about. So uh, the first step is we have to be self-controlled with our, we have to discern 
when their emotions are not biblical, we need to exercise biblical self-control on our end. And then the third step is to speak uh, words that help move them in the right direction. Is that helpful? Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, great question. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. So, uh, let's just say a, when you when you have a big event in your life, okay, could be a tragedy, it could be anger. It's it's a big moment, and you feel those emotions well up in you. What do you do with that? How do you, how do you respond biblically? Is that a fair? What's appropriate? Okay, so a couple of things. So because emotions are indicators of what's taking place in our hearts, as soon as we start to feel that emotion, whatever it could be, it could be sorrow, it could be um, fear, it could be anger, it could be whatever, it's, it's welling up. As soon as we start to feel that, we need to pray. And you say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm getting angry about this. I'm, I'm scared about this. I'm thinking of the psalm that says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. So it's an acknowledgement of the reality, the event. It's not a dismissing of it. It's not a suppressing of it, but it's acknowledging of it. And then you are immediately turning to the Lord in prayer. And then when I'm afraid, so that's the prayer, I put my trust in you. So then you, you have to put your trust in the Lord and the best place for your thoughts to land on that are on Scripture. So um, let me say it this way. Our hearts, um, we, we, are, uh, we have cognition, volition, affection. Okay, so that's mind, feelings, um, and will. And so our feelings are never disconnected from our thoughts. Okay, and our thoughts are never they should not be, they cannot be disconnected from our feelings. So when our feelings are rising, we uh, think on what's true and what's right and what's good and what's honoring, and that channels and forms our feelings accordingly. Um, uh, this happened this week. Uh, Jenny and I got some bad news, and Jenny was texting me about it, and <laughs> the, the text started out, and it said, um, uh, it's, I think it's Psalm 112, uh, verse 5. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. And then she told me the bad news. And uh, I'm like, that's great. That's great. Like, that stinks. Like, what happened? It stinks. It's not good. But uh, it gave my thoughts a place to land to say, um, my heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. I don't know how this is going to work out, but it will work out, and I'm going to need the Lord's help. Is that helpful? What? Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah, it's not a one side. It's not a one one and done. Yeah, um, blesses the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Uh, there's some emotions and some some events that are so tragic and so terrible that it, it takes years, years. Um, to feel like you're in a good spot. Um, now, those years have progress. Uh, th th those years, uh, the Bible talks about one degree of glory to another. Um, but it, it can take a long time, and it takes a lot of meditating on the law of the Lord. Yeah. All right, last one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I hate that, yeah. So sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, uh, what do you do when someone uh, they just they're constantly anxious, um, and uh, they just only say they're afraid. They're going to doctors. The doctor, the medications aren't helping. Uh, there's a whole lot to say there. Um, uh, and I, I will give a plug. Uh, we are going to do a, a course in the future on uh, mental health, which I'm excited about. So that'll be, it'll be in the future. Um, but real fast, what I would say there would be, um, 
uh, three Ps, okay? Uh, patience on your end. Um, plotting. Plotting. I know what I mean by that is one step at a time, small baby steps. Um, and then uh, presence. Um, your presence. So if, when someone's very anxious and they're overwhelmed, um, presence is a big deal in the scriptures. We draw near to them. We, uh, we don't shame them for their anxiety. We, we draw near. Um, plotting, uh, knowing uh, change is going to happen like a light switch that's, that's a dimmer, not one that you flip. Um, and then patience. Say, okay, I'm, I'm going to um, I'm going to treat them as Christ has treated me, which is uh, full of gentleness and meekness, and I'm going to I'm going to point them towards the truth over time. Uh, and then there's a bunch of resources I would use to do that the best we can. Yeah, but you're doing the right thing. Don't give up. You're doing great. Okay, that's it for tonight. Um, thank you guys for being here. Uh, don't forget if you're interested in the book, it's the last night to get it. And uh, don't forget the survey. And thank you to Mrs. Ganey for kindly administer. Give her a round of applause. She's been the administrator for the class. Thank you. Thank you guys. We'll see y'all on Sunday.